Man! Something about Easter Sunday just makes me feel like I can fly. You know what I mean? Hey, we're so glad that you took some time to come to church. Welcome. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, if you are new to our community today, it's your first time here, or maybe second time, third time, welcome. You made it. On a Sunday morning, it's 10 o'clock, and there was snow on the ground this morning, and you still came to church. I'm not one of those pastors that likes to shame people. I think we ought to just thank them when we see them, because there's so much going on in life today, so many priorities that we all have, so many things to do. Uh, but just by showing up on Easter this morning, you're saying, I want something from God today. And I believe he's going to do something. Hey, if you are new, we're glad you're here. My name's Billy. Alongside my wife, she was singing on the guitar. We have the privilege of leading this 13-week-old church now. Can you believe it, y'all? We're on week 13 since we launched. And, uh, you know, Easter is cool, like on a traditional sense, but we celebrate resurrection every day. I just believe that the Christian faith is more than just information for your mind. I believe that if God really did do something, and if he really is alive, that ought to change something in us. It ought to make us see life differently. It ought to make us walk with more hope and more just something in us that says, no, I'm not going to be defined by what I've done. I'm not going to be defined by the people around me. I'm going to hope that the best days are still ahead. And uh, I just got hope and faith this morning for something special. And so I want to jump right into the word, though. So if you got, a, got your Bible, go with me to John chapter 20. And uh, you can keep playing with us, Tommy. It was our worship team awesome this morning. Come on. Hey, if you're a musician or a singer, uh, there's plenty of room for you. I just, I think there's room for everybody in church to do something. John chapter 20, we're going to start reading in verse 11 today. And if you're new to the Bible, you're new to like a religious space or religious setting, um, don't be intimidated. Don't be nervous. This is a safe space. I believe that Christianity is it's not as much as what we do for God until it's first about recognizing what he's done for us. That's a good part to say amen right there. Like a lot of times we make our faith about these rules and these lists and I got to do this and I got to do that. And if I mess up and people don't even want to try because they feel like they're not good enough. And I just believe that the Bible is more important to your life than you might think. Um, I call it the love letter of God. You remember writing love letters? Sorry, love Snapchats or DMs, my bad. I'm just on that 32-year-old game right here. I'm like, I remember still writing notes, you know. Do you like me? Yes. With a little box. Maybe. With a little box. And there was no no, because I didn't want to get rejected, you know. Same with the Bible. This book is less about what you can do for God and more about a love letter about what he's done for you. And if you'll just give me the next 30 minutes, I hope that I can make sense of something for you. Verse 11, John chapter 20, when you have it, say, I got it. Oh, this is a good part, y'all. Okay, so here's what happened the night before. It's been completely silent. Jesus died on Friday. And uh, the Bible tells us in the beginning of John that Mary shows up at the tomb. And Mary comes to the tomb and she sees that the stone has been rolled away. Now, I always thought, why didn't Jesus just walk through the stone? Why not just, why do you got to roll it away to get out? He's God. Last week, we talked about how God sometimes leaves things open to invite us in. Not to demonstrate who he is, but he leaves things open to say, there's room for you to come and see if I am who I say I am. And so last week, Mary goes in and she's tripping. She can't believe that he's not there. She tells the disciples and they run to the tomb. The Bible says they don't see Jesus and they take off. And we pick it up in verse 11. It says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she stooped to look into the tomb, she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She can't find Jesus. You ever been there? Like, you know he's somewhere, but you just can't seem to find a click, can't seem to find that connection. Verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you took his body, tell me, because I don't want to go off on you like I did the disciple. Just tell me where he's at. 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have yet not ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and tell them I, as I am ascending to my father and to your father and my God and to your God. And here it is, verse 18, the first gospel preacher in the Bible, a woman that had messed up, 
People say she was a prostitute. We, we got some record of that, but we don't really know. Let's just say she was messed up. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, went and announced to the disciples the best thing you can announce. I have seen the Lord. I've seen him. I've seen him with my own eyes. Today, I want to talk to you a message that I've entitled Living Jesus, Living Jesus. And uh, I want to take the next few moments just to share some things from the word about what it means to really see Jesus for who he is. Not to see your idea of Jesus, not to see your mom's idea of Jesus, not to see your political party's idea of Jesus, just to see Jesus. Not all the extra stuff, just Jesus. Let's pray. Father, help us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, no time for a long prayer. Turn to someone and say, he's alive still. He's alive still. Thank you, brother. Uh, any married people in the building today? By a show of hands, married people. Notice how no one's cheering about that. You know what I'm saying? You do a si single people. Hey, you know, hey. Married people, though, I'm in that category now. I've been married coming on seven years, and uh, it's actually been almost seven, seven and a half years now, and, and just my wife, uh, literally the light of my life. Love her so much. She's, she's incredible. You know, when we were getting engaged, everyone was telling us all this great stuff about marriage. You know, marriage is going to be like a walk in the park. <laughs> I'm like, really? Which park? Marriage is going to be like this bright morning star every time you get together and marriage, you're never going to fight and everything's going to be great. And, you know, she's going to make your coffee right every time and she's going to bring you breakfast. And how many know none of that happened? Um, but one of the things we did when we got married is we decided to go on a honeymoon. And my wife, you know, we love New York. Since we've been in California, we've always loved New York, always loved uh, just the idea of being on the other side of the country. I always thought, like, what would it be like? And so our, our honeymoon, we decided to do a, a, a trip to New York City. And so my wife loves the city, grew up loving the city. And so we're in New York City and we're doing the husband and wife thing. We're newlyweds, you know, everything's awesome. Walking on sunshine, right? Everything's great. And one day she says, I want to go to the Empire State Building. I said, okay. So we took a subway into town and we start looking for it, walking around. We're in like the busy part of it. We go to Fifth Avenue. We're doing all this stuff. And I remember she's like, how long are we going to walk? And I said, well, I know it's got to be around here somewhere. There's, I'm looking at my phone. It says there's this great place next to it. Let's just go to that place, then we'll find it. And, you know, we're walking up the street, and then, you know, about 20 minutes go by, and, you know, you start getting more agitated with each other, okay? Don't act like you're holy. You're just, your wife starts to just, her voice sounds different. <laughs> You know, and, and, and then she's asking me questions, and then, you know, I'm saying stuff to her, and she's like, man, you're not as cute as I thought you were. And we're arguing and we're going back and forth and we walked up and down the street. And then finally, like I'm standing there, I'm like, I just don't know. And I just turned around and I looked, and I'm like, hey, the Empire State Building. <laughs> and it was this moment where we were so distracted in what we were feeling, what we were thinking, what we were assessing, that we didn't know what was in front of us was right there the whole time. What we needed, what we had been looking for, it wasn't in our thoughts about how to get there. It wasn't in, should we take the Uber? Should we take the subway? Should we walk? Are you crazy or we're going to walk? Like, it wasn't in all that right in front of us what was what we always needed. I, I, never, I didn't grow up in church as a kid. I met Jesus when I was 21. And so Jesus, for me, was never uh, this list of things to do and don't. He was always someone that says, follow me and I will show you what life is all about. Now, if, if, if we're honest, sometimes we say, show me what life is all about, and then I'll follow you. But that's not how you get Jesus. Jesus offers and invites us to come forward into who he is. And then he says, as you come, I will reveal more. Well, give me power, God, then I'll go. Just go, and I'll give you power. Well, give me some faith before I just, you know, do this crazy thing. Just go, and I'll be with you. And sometimes we think life and fulfillment is in all the nooks and crannies of our conversations and opinions. But not knowing that the true Jesus, the living Jesus, the one that we need, sometimes he's right in front of us every single day. John chapter 20 is an interesting passage. The Bible tells us that when Mary runs back and tells the disciples Jesus is alive, can you imagine this? The disciples thought Jesus is dead. They're in a room. And here comes Mary just knocking on the door, banging on the door. I've seen Jesus. He's not there. Can you imagine the disciples? Oh, gosh. Here's Mary again. She needs to let him go already. Mary thinks she can just walk the streets with that kind of faith. He's gone, Mary. You ever have somebody assess your faith, even though they don't even know what you saw? Who am I talking to? Okay. <laughs> you know, they, they start running towards the tomb, and the Bible says John and Peter are running together. And I broke this down last week, uh, but John is younger than Peter. Peter's the oldest disciple. John's the youngest disciple. And the Bible says that as they're running, 
it says that John outruns Peter and gets there first. Almost as if, well, yeah, because he's younger, he can outrun the older. But there's a principle about older representing wisdom and young representing passion. John is passion. Peter is wisdom. And something happens in our lives when we let our passion outrun our wisdom. And when we think that just because I can do it quick, I'm going to get there. And we get there, we don't know what to do. The Bible says John gets to the tomb and he just stands at the entrance. He got there quick, but he doesn't know what to do now that he's there. That's a word. Talk about parenting, man. Me and my wife finally became parents, but we were almost like, now what? What do we do now that we're here? Peter comes in, eventually Mary shows up, and the Bible tells us that Jesus isn't there. And uh, as she is leaving, she runs into a man inside the garden. And the text actually tells us, it's so incredible. It tells us, I think it was verse 15. It says, supposing him to be the gardener. She misunderstood who was standing right in front of her. She thought he was there to trim the hedges. She didn't know he was there to save her soul. She she didn't know that this man wasn't there just to keep the garden clean. He was there to cultivate a whole new understanding of what life is about. Adam and Eve, they sinned in a garden. It's no coincidence that in this moment she thinks he's a gardener because he is actually about to start work in our souls as the ultimate cultivator. He is going to be the one that sows seed of potential in us. He's going to be the one that tells us your marriage can grow more than it is right now. He's the one that says, yes, maybe you've lost somebody. Maybe you've lost something. But if you'll let me throw a seed in there. See, the thing about seed is it has to die before it grows. And we don't like death. We like resurrection. It's Easter. It's great. Let me take some pictures. And Where's the Easter bunny? Someone says, are you guys having an Easter bunny at your church? I say, you can go to the mall for that. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is about Jesus. You know, I had to do my lead pastor thing. I'm finally a lead pastor. I get to do it. Yeah. But there's this moment where Mary misunderstands who he is, and I think we've all been there before. I think we've all kind of thought we saw God as one thing, and then he revealed himself as another. I, I, let me add one more thing here. I have a mentor in my life, and he made one of the greatest statements I think I, I, I've heard. He said, it's very simple, and he said, the God you see is the God you get. Think about that. The God you see is the God you get. Your idea of God, your interpretation of God, how you think about God is probably the God that you're going to approach. And so if you see God as this judge, he's upset with you, you haven't been in church in a while, it's Easter, now you wanna come to church, this is your day, and you see God as this like, where you been? Well, you're gonna come in like, oh gosh, I hope he's not mad at me. But if you see God as a father, if you see him as a forgiver, if you see him as somebody that just wants you, you'll start to approach him a little bit differently. Our misunderstandings of Jesus go a long way, don't they? And if we're honest, we've all tried counterfeit gods in our life. We've all tried going after things that we thought was as good as Jesus. We've gone after other ideas, other religions, other substances, other things that might make us high but not make us whole. You know, are you with me? Like we're, we go after these things for these quick hits, but nothing's actually making us whole. Can I just be honest? It took me a while to get off drugs when I came to Jesus. It took me a while to get off of cocaine and smoking weed. And, and at one point I was an ecstasy guy, you know, like ravers and light shows and don't, no evidence exists anymore. <laughs> Someone's like, someone last week was like, hey, were you really a raver? I want to see some pictures. I'm like, gone, deleted. <laughs> but I know what it's like to go and try to find that thing. Like, oh, there's got to be more to life. And we've all done it. We look for it in our spouses. We think our spouses are our gods sometimes. We think our careers are our gods. We think that, 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 that the fame we get from these little bursts of dopamine in our heads from Facebook and we see someone like something, ooh, that feels good. And, and we think that is ultimate success. But there is something deeper today I'd love to tell you about. Something that's changed me. Something that literally I, I don't fear anything anymore because once you encounter the one who is life, there's not much that can shake that. Even death doesn't seem as scary when you know the one who's life. Luke's gospel tells the same incident with Mary, and look what it says in Luke chapter 24. Same story, same incident. Verse 4, it says, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood near them in dazzling apparel. These are the two angels. And look at verse 5. And, they, and as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground, and the men, said, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? And if that isn't a great verse for some of us, of how, for some of us how we've been living our lives, 
Why are you looking for life in a place where there's nothing but death? Why are you looking for meaning in a place that has never given it to you before? Why are you going back to something that could not define you if it tried? Jesus says, you're looking in the wrong place because we need it. We need fulfillment. And I'm not talking about exhilaration. Like I love to get exhilarated. I was playing the drums today. Man, that's fun sometimes. I get into it, exhilarating, that's awesome. But there's a difference between being exhilarated and being fulfilled. There's a difference between feeling good about I did something nice and now I feel like a good person to knowing I am whole because of Jesus. And I am whole not because of what I did for God's love, but because he did it for me. And now my life is a response to that. Oh, I feel like preaching this morning. I know it's Easter, but my God, there's got to be more to our faith. I just believe it like this. Why are we coming if it's not to encounter a living God? Like if you're new today, I'm so glad you're here. If it's your first time, please come back. We'd love to have you come back. But the only person we really need to come back is him. Because if he's not here, this is just a movie theater. And if he's not here, this is just a live show. And this is just motivation. But when he's in the room, lives get healed. When he's in the room, people get restored. Mindsets get altered back the right way. And we start finding alignment again in our purpose. When he's here, something changes. And so when we come to church, we believe that church should be an experience. We should be, it should be a great time, but we believe it should be an encounter with God. Because the goal of Christianity is not information. It's spiritual formation. Can I say that again? Put that quote up. The goal of Christianity is not just information. We're not here to just fill our heads with things. We're here to get our heart aligned into who he is. And I I have met a lot of friends that have issues with Christianity. Maybe you're here today and you consider yourself, you know, a little questionable towards faith or just some church people have hurt you. Or maybe there's been some things where you're like, I don't trust Christian people. Or, you know, the church is all hypocrites. There's plenty of room for you. No worries. You know what I mean? Like, Like, I'm a hypocrite then. If that's the case, we're all hypocrites. We're all trying to get to Jesus. So at the end of the day, the goal is not that we get a bunch of stuff that makes our minds tinkle. It's that we get something in our spirit that forms us to be better. I was talking to a college student a few months ago. I was here at Starbucks, and I wrote the conversation down because I just was there reading my Bible, and, you know, they, they came up and said, you know, there's no such thing as miracles. And I was like, you supposed to be like a philosophy major or something? Like, what's up? You know, like, and, and you know, we just started having a conversation, and really, really sweet uh, girl, like, you know, you, once you talk to somebody, you kind of know the route something going. And I'm like, okay, you're mad. So I was just like, hey, what, what, what other things do you have? What are some things you have against Christianity? Because how are we going to reach lost people if we never understand how they think and how they feel? So I believe the gospel is good news. Someone say good news. So the gospel is good news. So we have to get it close enough to people for them to believe it. But what's happened is we keep the good news back here and then we front end it with, well, if you're not perfect, I don't know if you should be coming to church. Oh, and it's like, it's actually the opposite. Because you're not perfect, you should be coming to church. So I'm having this conversation, and, and this, this led to some thoughts of my own, and, and it, it made me think about the four biggest objections that people have with Christianity. The four biggest things that maybe people would say, this is why I'm not a Christian. And if you are not a Christian today, maybe this is something you feel. If you are a Christian, this is something that maybe you should know to try to reach other non-Christians. So let me give you the four. Here's number one. There can't just be one true religion. Have you ever heard this before? Like, who are you to claim that your God is the right God? You know, uh, there's an illustration that says, you know, there's seven blind men touching an elephant and one person's touching the trunk and they think this is all of the elephant. One person's touching the tail. This is all of the elephant, but they're only touching a piece of it. Has anyone heard this before? That story falls apart because there is somebody that sees the whole thing telling the story. So, So when someone says, you can't make an exclusive claim about this, they don't know that by making that claim, that is exclusive. So there can't be just one religion. Uh, number two, why would good, a good God allow suffering? Anybody? Like, if God is good, then why do natural disasters happen? If God is good, then why do people get cancer? Why do kids get cancer? Why does this terrible thing in the world happen? And insert your own suffering, like your idea of suffering. Insert it there. If God is good, why would he allow such bad? Number three, hasn't science disproved Christianity? This is a typical thing I hear, especially amongst our university students. They say, well, I don't believe in the Bible because Christi- you know, science has disproved it. And, and, and let me just tell you that everything that we have found about science has not disproved God's existence. 
There is a lot that will tell us things, but science can only tell you what something is. It can't tell you something why something is. Can't tell you how that something lives and breathes and acts. And the last thing, number four, Christianity is a straight jacket. I used to preach this to kids every week. You want to come to Jesus? And they would go, do, 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 do I got to stop having sex? I'd say, uh, just come on down to Jesus. Let's worry about it later. You know, do I have to stop watching R-rated movies? And, and people don't come to faith because they think it's like, I'm not allowed to do anything. And if I go, I'm not ready to go to God because that means I got to stop doing what I want. And uh, I think there's a difference. Now I'll get into some points here. I think there's a difference between being free from something and being free for something. Are you with me? Like, like, like we can be free from, um, you know, limitations. I have freedom, so nothing can limit me. But that freedom has a reason, and it's for something. And so Paul said, I'm a slave to Christ. But this is also the guy that says he's more free in Jesus than he's ever been. So it's by having something to attach my life to that I find what my life is all about. What people are lacking is not good church to go to. What people are lacking is an understanding of how God designed them. They were designed with a reason and a purpose. And so I want to take four, these four things, and I only want to highlight two today. And I want to give you two uh, quick thoughts about just Christianity, just things that we read in John 20, and hopefully something that encourages you, but also something that maybe reveals something to you. Because I believe that God, you cannot prove the existence of God, but you also can't disprove it before some of y'all throw something at me. Someone says, you, can't throw, you, you can't prove God's existence, but you also can't disprove it. So I'm not here to tell you that Christianity is true in a sense that some of you need to hear it, but I'm here, number one, to show you that Christianity makes the most sense. I've just kind of learned this in my own skeptical journey. As I'm getting to a place of faith, I have to recognize that it's, it's, it's when you're talking to an atheist or you're talking to an, an agnostic and you're like, you know, they're like, well, how is God real? And you're like, because the Bible says so. And they're like, well, I don't believe in the Bible, so how is God real? And you're like, just because he's real. Because he is, because I believe it. And I think that that's, that's great at some point, but we also have to do our best to help people make sense of why Christianity seems to be true. Uh, Matthew 24 says it like this in verse 24, speaking of the end times, speaking of the end of the world. Jesus says, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up, and they will perform great signs and wonders as to deceive. So Jesus says there will be many counterfeit religions out there. There will be many false saviors out there. And when you think about religion, Tim Keller defines it like this. Religion is simply a set of beliefs that explain what life is all about, who we are, and the most important things that human beings should spend their times doing. He says, religion is really those big ideas. It's about what life is all about, who we are, and what we're supposed to spend our time doing here. That, that's, that's how you work it out. And what you do is you combine all these religions, you line them up, and the best way to judge a religion to find out is, is it true is you have to compare it to other religions. So it can't just be like, well, let's think about Christianity subjectively or objectively. Unless you, you have to say, okay, Christianity, Buddhism, you know, Judaism, and, and, and Hinduism, and Islam. Let's combine them all, and let's just try to find out which one makes the most sense. And there are ways of thinking about religion that can change how we encounter it. And I just did some of the background research for you. It's called job security. Um, <laughs> and, and here's what I've found out to be true about other religions. Here's what I found out. And if you feel otherwise, I'd love to talk after church. Feel free to, to come forward. But I've noticed that other religions say this really about life. They say that I obey these other gods and therefore I am accepted. That, that's what I know to be true about some of these other religions. Pray three times a day. Wash your hands five times a day. Do these kind of things. Transcend. Escape from life to get higher to, to you know, Narnia and all that stuff. And, like, do all this kind of stuff. And, and it would be great. You know, Nirvana, not Narnia. Okay, you know, get up here. Like, everything would be great. And, and that might be true. But I find acceptance only after I've obeyed. What I know about the gospel is the gospel says, in Jesus, I am accepted. Therefore, I obey. God's not looking for your obedience to some of his strictest things today if you haven't first accepted that he has done something for you. The good news of Jesus is not obey all the rules so you can be saved. The good news of Jesus is you are accepted in the free gift of salvation. And if you put your trust in Jesus, therefore, you are saved. 
Well, prove it. Don't worry, I will. Ephesians chapter two. Look what verse eight says. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. So it doesn't say by grace and works, you have been saved. Let me just float that out there. Like I love Catholics, but Catholicism has this teaching of grace and works for salvation. And I just don't believe that to be true about the Bible. The Bible tells us you're saved by grace and that produces in you good works. So someone that's not producing good works, I would just question, have they truly encountered Jesus? Because when you see him for who he really is, you don't want to do anything else but tell people who he is. When you see him for who he is, you don't want to think the way you used to think. You've been saved by grace. Let's continue on. And it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This ain't a club here. He's not saying we're going to have some people that are better Christians than others. You know, you know our scripture. You've prayed for more people. You're a pastor. You must have like a more connection with God. And it's like, I have a calling, but it doesn't mean that I can connect with him more than you can. Say amen, somebody. This is good news. Like you don't need a pastor to get you to God. Because by grace you have been saved so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we, as work, we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's not that you've been saved from something. Ephesians 2 says you've been saved for something. Ephesians 2 says that God has put a purpose and a reason on your life. Um, I remember the first time sitting with a guy in one of my small groups and he started telling me his journey about recovery. And, you know, he's been clean this long and working on his recovery. And I was like, wow, it's incredible. And then just over the next couple of weeks, I was speaking life into him. I'm like, God's going to use your story. God's going to use your story. And then like every Sunday I'm meeting somebody that's like, you know, do you know any kind of support for recovery or like any kind of help? Like, I'm just trying to get better. And I'm like, sure, let me introduce you to my guy. Sure. Let me introduce you to my guy. Let me introduce you to my guy because God saved him from alcoholism, but he saved him for helping others. Are you with me? And I believe he wants to do the same in you, that there's a four for you too, that it's not just about you're no longer sinning, no longer in the world, no longer making sense of things. It's God has saved you for a reason, for a purpose. And so my, my, my wife and I, we rolled into this town last year in January, and we just said, what would it look like of a church that's filled with people that know their purpose? Not a church filled with people that like to come to church. It's important. But what if we had a town where people, everybody knew why they were created? and what they could do with their lives. Jesus just seems to show us that it makes more sense that he came to us to show us the meaning of life. That God as creator is different than any other religions. Maybe you're here and you're like, you know, I believe in God, but just, you know, it's just the big bang theory. That's just where I'm at. Well, let's consider that the beginning of Genesis chapter one, verse one. Like that doesn't mean that there's not a God because you have a theory about something just means that maybe this God is bigger than you actually think. A couple tips for growing in faith. If you want to grow in your faith and you're here, let me give you three real quick and we'll move on. Three things that I think you can start doing today to grow in your faith. Number one, just ask questions. If you ever have questions about anything you hear from this platform, anything you hear in any of our messaging or our content, ask Come, please, I, I welcome it, you know. We've got to be Christians that are confident enough in eternity and we just want to know stuff now. And I just want to ask questions and, and figure out, like, what is this all about? Uh, secondly, look for faith. To grow in your faith, look for people who have it already. Surround yourself with an environment of believers that you know, like, when I show up in this room, it's, things are going to get better. Things are going to get lifted up. Look for faith. Because uh, faith affects the atmosphere. D did you know that? You ever been, like, uh, you ever been in a room and everybody's all positive and then in walks one negative person and it's like, ugh. You know, I was a youth pastor. I used to have meetings with our youth team, about 15 kids are on our leadership team. And I'd be like, all right, guys, here's what we're doing. Here's the vision. You know what I mean? Here's what God's going to do. Come on, aren't you excited? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's always that one kid that's like, maybe, maybe. I don't know if that's going to work, Billy. You know, and I'm sitting there like, Jesus, you know, I'm going to smack this kid. I would never. I'm a man of God. But help me, Lord. You know, why that one person's attitude affects the environment. Maybe you're not seeing results in your life because you've been in the wrong environments. Maybe there's not enough faith injected into your week 
I have guys in my life, all they want me to do is just text them. I'm still trying to get them to come to my small group, still trying to get them to show up, you know, on a Wednesday night. But they're just like, well, if you could just text me like a verse every week. And I'm like, all right, I'll take it then. You know what I mean? Like, because we just got to start somewhere. Let's just inject some faith into what we've got going. And then lastly, number three, tips for growing in faith. Never know it all. Oh, if you can commit to being a lifelong learner when it comes to this. Like there are people that spend their whole life studying this and still haven't figured it out. There are people that have spent their entire journey of faith just trying to know things that God intentionally hasn't revealed. Because if you knew it all, you wouldn't need a God, would you? So as a Christian, I just commit to never know it all. So Christianity makes sense. And lastly, number two, I want to hit this. Suffering is like, you know, why would a good God allow suffering? Well, I think that suffering isn't evidence against God. That, that, that's my point. I don't believe that suffering is evidence against God. Because I can't tell you how many people I've met that they just say, I can't go any further here. I just can't go any further in my faith. Why? Well, because, you know, my, my uncle died in a tragedy and I just can't register why God would take him from me. Have you heard this before? Or you felt this before? Just this sense of like, if God is so good, why are bad things happening? And, and why does God allow bad things? Like, if he's God, why isn't he stepping in? And uh, I want to jump into that for the remainder of our time together. Because there are people here in this room that you have suffered. And you have been through some things. And, and it would be an error of me to try to assume that all of our suffering is the same. Oh, yeah, guys, you've suffered. I've suffered. It's all good. No, we all have different ways and means that we suffer. Uh, but what's important is not that we suffer differently. What's important is that we direct our suffering the same way. John chapter 16 says it like this. Jesus addressing his disciples he says, I've told you these things that in me you may have no suffering. Well, no, he doesn't say that. He says that you may have peace. And if you think peace is the absence of pain, well, then you might be thinking of the wrong peace. Because he's talking about something deeper here, I think. When he talks about peace, when Jesus talks about peace, he's talking about shalom. He's talking about the, the, the entirety of your being at peace, the entirety of your household at peace, the entirety of your soul at peace. He says, I've told you these things that you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. This is Jesus. Jesus says, you guys don't think you're going to suffer. Let me just be honest with you today. On Easter Sunday, you will suffer in life. And Jesus says, in this life, you will have much trouble. But take heart. I have overcome that suffering. I have overcome that world. Uh, there's a Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. He's a neurologist, a psychiatrist. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And while he was in concentration camps during World War II, he lost his family. His mom and dad died in concentration camps. His wife died. Uh, he lost one of his kids in concentration camp, but he survived. And he writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he says this. He says, if there is meaning in life at all, then there must be a meaning in suffering. Because suffering is an errata, errata, ineradicable, <laughs> ineradicable part of life, even as faith, even as death. Without suffering and death, human life cannot be complete. It's not popular preaching. It's not, not going to give you the heebie-jeebies. But there is a sense of peace in knowing that Jesus is direct about this in John 16. Jesus says you will have suffering. You will have tribulation. You will have things taken from you. But what I've known in my experience is that God helps make suffering make sense. God makes the suffering we go through make sense in our, in our lives. Three things about suffering. Suffering is painful. Hello. It hurts. And in our church, it's okay to not be okay. You can come with your pain. That's what the altar's for. That's right. So the church is for. Uh, suffering is also perplexing, though. You don't know why it's going on. You know, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord and that which has been revealed to us belongs to us. So it's almost as if God has these things that he knows, but we don't know. And, and we hold him to the standard of things we don't know instead of just doing the things he told us to do. It's, just, it's perplexing, but I've known this to be true about suffering. It's purposeful. It's purposeful. As I close today, um, if you're here and you don't, believe in God, or maybe you question God, or maybe you know you want to come back to God, but there's been this thing about suffering and, and just how could God allow this, you know? Uh, we have some people that think like bad things shouldn't happen, 
They don't believe in God. They don't believe, you know, but they think that, well, if God's good, bad things shouldn't happen. And my question is always, if you don't believe in God, where do you get good and bad from? Like, if you don't believe that God is true, but you don't think bad things should happen, so how do you classify something as bad? And he says, oh, well, we get that from, our na from nature. We get that from our bodies and we get that from our brains. And, and I said, well, that's not true because, you know, evolutionary theory is the stronger eat the weaker. That's wrong. Like, whether you like it or not, stronger eating the weaker, like with animals, we're like, oh, it's fine. But once it jumps into humans, we have this, we're like, oh, well, there is no God because look what's happening. And I just think that suffering, again, is not evidence that God is not real. If anything, suffering is evidence that we need God. If anything, suffering is evidence that God himself stepped into our suffering. Philippians chapter two says it like this, the, Paul, uh, the apostle Paul writes, and he says, have this mind among yourself, the way you think, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was God, like though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself even to death on a cross. What Paul says is Jesus was fully God when he died for you and I. And he could have called down angels to rescue him from that moment. Like you can imagine this, Jesus is on the cross. And on Friday, they nailed him to the cross and everyone, his disciples are there and the Romans are there and people are jeering at him and they're yelling at him and screaming. And all of a sudden, one walks up and says, hey, it's Roman. He goes, if you're Elijah, why don't you come down? He says, hey, if you're really God, why don't you get off the cross? And oh man, you don't think Jesus could have done that? Just pop those nails off on Jackie Chan or something. They said, hey, if you are who you say you are, come off the cross. And I've learned this when it comes to suffering. Sometimes it takes more faith to stay on it than it does to get off it. Sometimes it takes more faith to sit in your suffering, to sit and look at the ashes, to look at the things that went wrong, the things that broke, and then remind your soul that we serve a God that has beauty in the ashes, that in the midst of the ruin, there's still a purpose. Today, you can be encouraged. Jesus is up there. And the Bible says that he kept thinking about us. He could have came down, but it says he was thinking about what would happen after that. So how could a good God allow suffering? Why does God allow suffering? I know it can't be because he doesn't love us. Like, I don't know why God allows suffering. There you go. I don't know why. But I do know that it can't be because he doesn't love us because the Bible says that he loved Jesus eternally that he has loved Jesus since the beginning of time and will continue to love the son forever. He loves the son so much and the son suffered. So your suffering, it's not evidence that God's not with you. Your suffering is a reminder that though we suffer with Jesus, we will raise with Jesus. Though we go down with him, the Bible says we come up with him. Next week is Baptism Sunday here at Gospel, and you're gonna see people go down into the waters and their old life left behind, and when they come up, it's gonna be the love of God that keeps someone going. Oh, I plead to you this morning, if you've got questions about God, don't sit on them too long because he is 100% sure about you. If he was and he wouldn't have sent his son to die. Would you close your eyes for a moment this morning if you're here and you don't know this God on a personal level? Maybe you're here and you think that the gospel is a bunch of do's and don'ts. Today, I wanna show you it's a person. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says he came and lived a sinless life. He died a death that you and I deserve. And today is only the beginning. If you say yes to Jesus today, this is only the beginning. You're invited now into a lifestyle of knowing him, growing in him and becoming like him. And if you're here and you say, I wanna know Jesus today, I wanna become a Christian. Or maybe you're here and you're like, I haven't been one. I don't feel like one. I need to give my life back to Jesus today. I'd love to include you in this prayer. And if that's you, would you slip your hand up on the count of three? Don't look around, just a moment of privacy. If that's you and you wanna, you wanna, you wanna meet Jesus today, you need him, you need prayer for him. If that's you, lift your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. So that's me in the room today. I need to know Jesus like you're talking about him. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. 
Come on, can we say this prayer together, church? Would you say, dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he died for me. So today I want to live for him. I believe he rose again. So today I rise again. In Jesus' name. And if you believe it, would you say amen? Come on, one more time. Clap your hands, y'all, for those that made that decision. Okay, first things. If you did pray that prayer, about three people, I think, today, and you don't have a Bible, or you would need prayer for something specific, or you just need help with something specific, um, please go to our Next Steps table after church. We'd love to connect you. We'd uh, love to let you know just what we think might be next for your journey with God and, and what that looks like. Um, and it'll be great. Secondly, uh, if it is your first time today, uh, we want to just bless you with something. And, you know, I, we're not expecting you to come back. But if you're here and you're new to our church, if you'll fill out one of those cards, um, I've got a couple copies of, of my first book and my second book from a couple years ago. So if you're a first time guest, we'll give you a book for free today uh, just for showing up, just for saying hi, giving us your info. Um, all we're going to do is email you like every six weeks and uh, hopefully stay connected if we can. Thirdly, do we, is there a sound working on the video now? Okay, cool. Let's check this video out with announcements, then I'll be back to lead us in a time of offering. Thanks for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or are looking to connect with us, fill out a Next Steps card and leave it in the offering bucket on the way out. Baptism Sunday is next Sunday following our 10 a.m. service. If you'd like to be baptized, visit the Next Steps area or gospelchurch.co forward slash baptism. Child dedication is for children ages 0 to 11 and their parents to be dedicated to God. On the last Sunday of every month, we give parents a chance to participate in a special ceremony with their children during service. To register your child, visit Gospel Kids or Next Steps or text FRESH to 94000. To celebrate single moms this Mother's Day, we're hosting a free spa day on May 9th from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. If you'd like to receive free hair and nail services, register at gospelchurch.co forward slash mom. Thanks again for joining us at Gospel. You are loved and we're so thankful to have you here. Now let's prepare our hearts for a time of generosity. All right. Hey, we're going to close our service now with giving. Um, our ushers are going to be at the door on your way out. If you'd like to give, they'll have a black bucket. You can do so. Just drop it in there. Um, if you're new to church, no pressure to give. It's your first time. Don't feel pressure to give. But we do believe there's something uh, so important about being generous. And the church, all the church wants is my money. The church does not want your money. God is after your heart. And at the end of the day, money has a big factor in how we live our lives. Where we go, what we eat, what we drive, like it, it just affects everything. Can we do this? Can we not do that? We think through financially. And so it's just a, another way to worship God with our resources and say, you know what? Today I'm going to trust you, God. And uh, every dollar you give helps us continue the mission of this church. Um, today we, we're going to have, by the end of this day, we'll have about 100 people that joined us online. So it helps us continue to advance in different parts of the country and just blessing people and also needs in our community. You know, as we hear about things, we're able to respond because of your generosity. And so I want to thank you for that this morning. Um, it means a lot. You know, when, when I left California and just came over with my wife, I was like, we'll see how this goes. And God has been faithful and you've been generous. And our church has been able to do things um, that I never thought we could. You know, we've given away like four grand this year already. You know what I mean? Just helping other church planners. We sent money to the war going on in Europe. We sent it directly to World Help, who goes out and helps with refugees. And we work with organizations just to just try to make a difference, you know? just to try to make a small dent in the kingdom of darkness. We just want to do our part. So it's a great thing, all right? As you're finishing giving, don't forget, bring that card if you want a book on your way out. Let's all stand. I want to pray for you, and we'll let you out. Next week, we're going to start at 10 o'clock again. Um, we'd love to invite you back. If you are interested in getting any information or connected, you can do so in the lobby. And thank you guys for celebrating Easter with us. We appreciate you making it a point to come and uh, worship the Lord. So let's pray. Hey, if you came with your spouse, uh, would you grab their hand right now? If you came with a partner, would you grab their hand? If you came with just a friend or just maybe put a hand on their shoulder, if you want to grab their hand, just want to pray together. Yep. Father, thank you for today. Thank you. This is the day you've made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Today as a church, we say we're thankful for resurrection. We're thankful that the Jesus we know is still alive and still well. 
And so today, as we go out, we thank you for life inside us that'll flow outside of us. Lord, thank you for life in our relationships, our friendships. Thank you for life in our workplaces and our schools. Thank you for life in our doctor's offices and our supermarkets. Lord, we pray life would be more than just this building we gather in, but life would flow through us as we go out today. I bless each person here that they would be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, that they would walk in the blessings of God. They would walk in the love of a faithful God. So we bless you now. May the rest of this week be the best of your week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen. 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 Hey, if you need anything, come on forward. Otherwise, have a great Sunday. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.